we're all being recorded. I guess everybody's aware of that now. Um, let me start by thanking the um, OFG chairs. Um, so thank you, Barbara, for introducing us. Thank you also to Joel Nielsen, who uh, is a close collaborator of many years, and Tanish Puranam, um, who I've also worked with in the past. So it's fantastic um, to be able to, uh, to lead this uh, webinar today. Um, the topic that we have is innovation within the UN organizations. That, that's quite a special topic. Um, so I'd like to uh, actually take a few minutes to introduce uh, not only our panelists, but also the, the purpose of the session. Um, our panelists uh, in the order of their speaking are Catherine Tatarina from the University of Geneva. She's the research director of the Innovation and Partnership Center and her um, research really centers on innovation in the UN. Uh, has done a lot of studies, some of them together with me, on how innovation is actually organized in the UN. So she'll share some insights uh, from this work with you from a more academic perspective. Uh, then we have Julian Birkenshaw from the London Business School, who uh, is an expert um, on uh, strategy, organization, and innovation. And he's uh, always rated amongst the most influential management thinkers in this world. And he'll share a particular, a broader perspective on innovation and how that contrast from the private sector with uh, maybe the UN setting. And then he'll also help us to synthesize a little bit um, our different thoughts and inputs from our speakers. We'll take a short break after those um, academic inputs to have some Q&A and to be able to engage in a discussion. And then we'll switch to uh, our free practitioners who are all experts in innovation and innovation leaders in your organizations. First, we have uh, Nicola Holden, who uh, is the uh, Chief of Digital Culture at uh, the United Nations Development Program. Uh, she worked for the World Food Program before, where she was an innovation um, leader at the World Food Program Innovation Accelerator. So she's really one of the people driving innovation in the UN, has a lot of experience that uh, she'll share with us today. Uh, then we have uh, another innovator from the UN system, Corinne Momalbanyon. She's now the executive director of the Kofi Annan Foundation. Uh, before taking that role, she actually was the director of conference management um, at the United Nations office in Geneva and has led uh, several innovation campaigns there. So I'm very much looking forward also to hearing uh, from her. And last but not least, we have Marcus Nordberg, who is leading Idea Squares at CERN, uh, one of the most innovative organizations in this world. And obviously CERN is not part of the United Nations, but it's also an international organization and a purpose-driven organization. So we're really trying to enable some cross-sector learning with these different perspectives. And that's very much the purpose of the session to have like an academics practitioner dialogue and to also leave some room for engagement, for a discussion questions. Uh, where we can hopefully share ideas and learn something new. So as we, with a webinar, never really know who you are in the audience, uh, we'd love to run a short poll with you uh, to see where you're actually coming from, what is your interest, and uh, the question is simple, which sector do you work in, private, public, academia, United Nations, or other? Just give this 30 seconds, and I think this will be relatively quickly answered, I hope. Okay, so we give it five more seconds. Okay, okay brilliant. So we have a, a relatively uh, balanced audience between private sector, academia, and United Nations. Uh, we also have a lot of others that so will be interesting to hear where exactly you are from then, and 7% uh, public sector. So thank you so much for sharing this. So let's really uh, make this a very interactive uh, session and hopefully one where we can really exchange knowledge from those different sectors. Introducing why we need to speak about innovation in the UN and why we believe it's an important topic in the Organizing for Good series. Uh, when we speak about innovation in the United Nations, our innovation for sustainable development goals uh, in general, often that's a bit vague and it's hard for people to imagine what really is going on there. But I just wanted to highlight some real life examples to make it more tangible for you. It could be uh, innovative products, for example, such as a school in a box for refugee camps, or it could be um, a uh, virtual wallet for refugees, which is based on blockchain. So these are all initiatives that came out of United Nations organizations that were, were part of the research that uh, Catherine and I have actually done. And uh, what we found in our research is that they actually have a long lasting impact 
on the UN organizations in the sense that they also have transformative impact, right? So they don't only serve the social beneficiaries there, but they also contribute to changing the organizations. If we think about the UN, probably don't always right think about innovation because we know that these organizations are you know big bureaucracies very hierarchical they're owned by governments and are globally you know distributed and very complex so this does not provide a kind of intuitive environment for innovation but still these organizations need to drive innovation in order to uh, basically achieve their missions and uh, to uh, help us all achieve the sustainable development goals Interestingly, you know, me speaking as an academic from a management research perspective, we do not often look into this context, right? So we either look into NGOs, the kind of government or of government, but mostly into businesses, of course. But uh, we hardly ever look at the specific contingencies United Nations organizations actually have. And uh, so I wanted to actually use the session to give you some more insights and to discuss uh, with all of you to see what are the contingencies in the United Nations that can help us spur innovation that can help us uh, achieve innovation uh, for the sustainable development goals. So without any further ado, uh, I'll start the second poll or ask Amelia to start the second poll, uh, where we wanna hear from you, what do you think are the greatest management challenges of innovating in the UN? And we gave you some answers, which were kind of coming out of our conversations and research in that sector, scaling, resourcing, partnerships, the internal structures, internal processes, talent and capabilities. And of course, there might be many more others. And if you think about others, feel free to post them in the chat and we'll be very happy to take them up in discussion. So while I still let you fill the poll, uh, we can actually pick up the uh, results in a minute. I uh, hand over to Katya to uh, start with her presentation. Thank you very much, Tina. So as you finish up um, the poll, we I can introduce myself. I work for the University of Geneva as a postdoctoral researcher. I'm also running the Geneva Innovation Movement Association, um, where we apply many of our uh, research findings uh, to the real world. So I'll just close the poll here and pick up um, the results. So as you can see the results, what are the greatest management challenges of innovating in the UN? Uh, many of you said the internal structures uh, coming out at the top there, and we see internal processes and scaling. And we'll come back to this. So just remember those top three challenges that came out of this, because this aligns very closely with what we found in our research over uh, the last five years, actually exactly those three challenges. So structures, internal processes, and scaling. Um, so today I'll very quickly talk to you about the innovation pressures in the UN. Um, the rise of innovation units, since this is a topic on organizing innovation, how do we organize innovation structures? What does this look like across different organizations? Um, the main challenges in this context, and then how does this context differ from the private sector? And what does this really mean for the 50% of us here that are practitioners? What does this mean for us? Um, so what are the pressures? I just said about the three challenges that you voted on, you see these three challenges here. Um, so you have the impact challenge, how do we make impact uh, in our organizations. And this is very much about how can we identify and reach multiple layers of beneficiaries? So this is the challenge that sits between fulfilling and improving the internal working culture of our organization so that people working in the UN um, are actually happy and content there and feel that they can contribute somehow to the organization while also delivering the correct services uh, quickly and efficiently to our beneficiaries. And then this also involves measuring impact. What does this mean? What does it mean in terms of timelines? And how can we measure impact when profit cannot be measured? Then you mentioned scaling and organizing. So on the scaling challenge, this is about the member states and the global and local beneficiaries. How can we de design innovations for global deployments that are also at the local level still relevant? And how can organizations support knowledge transfer between the headquarters and the subsidiaries, the subsidiaries being the country offices here, uh, in a way that is resource uh, beneficial for everyone. And then finally, the organizing challenge. You mentioned internal processes and structures as being a hindrance. Um, so what are the new business models that we can develop and which levers can we use to really create a movement both within the organization uh, as well as with external stakeholders to develop um, an innovation ecosystem? And once we started looking at these challenges, what we found in the last few years is there's been a huge rise of innovation units 
so innovation teams and innovation structures within these organizations that start to address different types of challenges. Um, we see at the International Trade Center, the, their innovation unit was set up to really unleash the full potential of creativity. And they do a lot of trainings and workshops for their staff. So it's a culture change unit. The same with the IMF Innovation Lab. Uh, we see some units such as UNHCR, which really straddles two different challenges. At the same time as they're trying to train and improve the capabilities internally, they're also looking to experiment and drive a lot of this innovation to the local level as well. We have UNDP and World Food Program, which we'll hear more from, from Nick about and how they run. Um, so UNDP really looks at how do you bring innovation to the local level? They've set up these uh, accelerator labs in the country offices and the World Food Program as well sits separately from the headquarters and really tries to localize a lot of these initiatives and ideas uh, to the country offices. And finally, we also have a different type of innovation unit. So a third uh, challenge being addressed on organizing, for example, such as UNAID's Office of Innovation, which acts to connect external initiatives to the challenges that their organization is facing and get them funded uh, and connected to the public sector. So who does what? Uh, what we see as we've seen this rise, we've watched a lot of the birth of these innovation units. Um, we've seen, for example, UNDP completely transform their innovation facility. They now have over 91 accelerator labs across the world. Some of these are fully decentralized, such as UNDP moving towards decentralization, uh, UNHCR starting to set up distributed hubs, uh, World Food Program, as mentioned, sits separately, while some are extremely centralized. So there's very different approaches to structuring and organizing innovation units, depending on the goals of the unit and the goals of the organization. What are the main challenges in this context? We see that it's a fine balance between doing innovation inclusively across the organization, so including anyone, everyone in the organization, but also um, very difficult to avoid becoming a closed vault where people think that's the team that does innovation and then I do not have to do it. Um, so this is the fine balance that these units often walk. We see the main challenges in this particular UN context is resourcing, where a lot of the donor money that's given to these organizations uh, is seen as not um, something that can be used for experimenting and, and innovating and not something that can be failed with. Uh, we see fluctuating and poorly defined mandates that these units have. And finally, sometimes they have legitimacy concerns that they're not really addressing the true mandate of the organization. The rest of the organization can see that this unit is not legitimate. And of course, as mentioned before, it's very difficult to measure success, uh, particularly when profit is not something that you can use. Very quickly to finish up, in our research, we saw that these units had four different roles that they played within the organization. On the one hand, they focus internally on building capacity through training programs, uh, developing internal capabilities and skill sets, changing the mindset through training, exposure, um, and then also linking headquarters and field country units. And then on the other side, they also have this external focus. So developing stakeholders, partnerships, new collaborative processes. They're setting the agenda in the ecosystem and also developing an ecosystem of cross-sectoral partnerships uh, and sourcing ideas from the ecosystem, as well as opening up new ways of funding to allow further experimentation and innovation uh, in the organization. And so what we say is actually this is a new phenomenon that deserves a new perspective, a new way of, of looking at innovation units and organizing innovation in large bureaucratic uh, social organizations uh, where their true value is difficult to measure. And we call this alternative perspective the relational perspective. Uh, which comes from different researchers in the past in the management research. And we say that this changes goal setting and strategy setting in the way these organizations uh, actually work. So it contrasts the established view that the only way you can create value as a unit for your uh, organization is through patents or product development. And we actually say that they develop value through creating relationships and building this ecosystem. And they benefit from having these relatively ambiguous goals so that they can change and oscillate their attention back and forth from this internal activities that I highlighted and these external stakeholders, building these external stakeholders. So what does this mean for the practitioners? First, it means that we have different success metrics that we can use um, as we start to show what does success really mean? We don't have to say it just means 
uh, a new product or a new patent, we can say that it means you know, developing new relationships, creating a new position for our organization in the ecosystem. Uh, it's also about understanding that innovation is not just about developing uh, products and processes, but it, it can be about creating culture change. And then finally, it's a new way to look at the way the unit creates value for the organization. So I stop there and I hand over to Julian. Thank you very much, Katya. Um, so let me share a couple of thoughts. Um, I've been working in the field of innovation in large complex organizations and particularly private sector organizations for, I guess, 25 years or so. So, so I've seen um, a lot of sort of ideas come and go. I've seen a lot of organizational practices come and go. And so I just want to provide a bit of context, particularly for those of you who come from the private sector as to what makes this particular set of studies that Katia and Tina have been doing uh, so, so interesting and so unusual. I'll just share my screen. I've only got a couple of slides, but, but just to provide you with a, a little bit of structure. Um, the, um, the, the, the image on the right is a book called Orbiting the Giant Hairball, uh, by a guy called Gordon McKenzie. He worked at Hallmark Cards. And I mean, there's many books out there, but this one is particularly kind of relevant because it's a book about this guy who uh, was trying to be innovative within Hallmark Cards. Uh, and he tried to set up, among other things, one of these innovation units. And, and of course, the imagery of, of a giant hairball, which is the corporate sort of bureaucracy. And he's trying to do stuff sort of trying to be sort of linked to that hairball, for want of a better word, but also being separate from it, I think helps to capture some of the challenges involved. So three questions I'm gonna answer in my eight minutes or so. Why do companies set up standalone innovation units? I mean, it's almost always because there's a sense that the, the, the traditional line organization is somehow failing to innovate effectively. And we all understand, I think, intuitively why that is, because the line organization is so focused on, on delivering on its operational priorities, making money as per its budget, as per its expectations, that there is no time to do the uh, interesting new stuff. Uh, there's no sort of patience for investing in things which, give, which have a sort of a payoff over years or decades. So with that frustration, uh, a lot of companies say, well, we need to, to create one of these units which puts dedicated resources in, which puts a little bit of, if you like, patient capital behind some of these ideas, whereby we can actually kind of hothouse ideas which would otherwise get killed off. And so over the decades, we've seen many of these innovation units created, many, many names, sometimes skunk works, sometimes adventuring units, you will have heard of the notion of accelerators and incubators, which uh, are sort of an umbrella term for, for housing a number of specific ventures or projects and so forth. So lots of these sort of things are cre created almost always, as I say, as an antidote to the problem that has been a lack of innovation in the core businesses. What is it that these units do? And the best way to, to answer that, I'll just show my second slide. Um, what these innovation units do, it, it varies a, a great deal. There are, this is a, a typology I put together, uh, oh gosh, 10 years ago or so. And essentially we were looking at so-called corporate venturing activities. Uh, and these do, uh, if you like, four different things. They can either focus on pure exploration, coming up with completely new ideas, or they can focus on exploitation, which means essentially harnessing existing assets and capabilities and using them in, in creative ways. And of course, they can also be focused on internal or external opportunities. And you put those two dimensions together, you get these four different types of units. And, and I'm not gonna sort of take you through the details of what each of these look like. There's a story behind each of them. The point is simply that, that each of those units can potentially do something different in a focused and aligned way. So I, I remember way back, I mean, this is showing my age, but Nokia, uh, when Nokia was a successful company, Nokia actually had at least three different venturing units, all doing different things. And the innovation venturing units in the top left was all about trying to kind of figure out what the next 
thing was, obviously they got that a bit wrong. Um, whereas, you know, they also had a unit in the bottom right, which was completely standalone. And it was almost like an independent venture capital entity. And the key point is because they were doing such different things, they could more or less focus and align those activities. They could prioritize their resources in the right way. And uh, the, the, the powers that be, if you like, stood standing above them, understood what they were doing and why they were doing it. And that was very helpful. Um, so that is what these units do. They do a variety of different things. It's all about innovation, but of course, innovation has all these different guises. Uh, my third point though, and this is really the heart, the crux of it, is how successful are they? And the answer is not very. In other words, if I take a kind of a, uh, a bird's eye view over many waves of these things, um, the chances of these units surviving more than three to five years are very low. I mean, I'm not saying uh, they never survive. That Shell, for example, Shell Corporation has had a unit called Game Changer, which in various guises has existed for 20 years. Uh, we can also think of some of these corporate venture capital type units. Often they have independent investors and sometimes that allows them to, to survive for much longer. But, and, and there's many of those which have survived for 10 plus years. But the point is those are the exceptions that prove the rule. The bottom line is these units are fragile. And the reason why they're fragile is, is not surprising. Um, and it links back to what Katya said, um, they often end up struggling to take their ideas and then linking them up to uh, activities in the main business units. And as a result of that, the main business units some often look at them askance. They say, you know, what are these guys doing? I don't understand it. There's often even a little bit of schadenfreude when they feel that, you know, these guys failed because they didn't take us seriously and they didn't work with us. Um, and the other problem is that actually proving that they have created sufficient value to be justified is really hard because after, let's say, three to five years, uh, they've been doing their stuff for a while. There may be a change in leadership at the top. A new chief executive comes in. He or she says, you know, I'm trying to kind of make my mark. I'm going to take a look at the things my predecessor did. What are those guys doing? I'm not sure that's that useful. I'm not sure if they've really delivered on what they said they were. So I'm going to close it down. And that happens all the time. So that's, that's why they often fail. So, you know, dispersed innovation among business units often fails. Focused innovation units of the type we're talking about here often fail. That shouldn't surprise us. I mean, innovation is inherently difficult in any sort of organization setting. But I will finish with one, one last thought, and it links back to what, what Katya said, which is that these innovation units uh, are typically created with um, sort of definitive objective performance criteria in mind. And if you're in a corporation, that means creating new revenues, new profits. Sometimes it might mean creating uh, technologies or patterns that can be used elsewhere. But companies are expecting to see some sort of hard evidence that they've done something, which is not unreasonable. And yet the trouble is, because these things take such a long time to achieve, very often these units either haven't had time to deliver those things, or actually sometimes they fail to deliver those things. And this is why the, the UN setting uh, that Katia and Tina have been focusing on is so fascinating because, uh, and we're gonna kick this around for the next hour or so, but you know, the notion that, that you are delivering outcomes in the form of tangible products or patents or whatever is much more up for discussion I would say in the UN setting than it is in a corporate setting. Um, so this shift from the idea that a unit creates value by creating assets or resources or capabilities can to some degree be challenged and, and, and saying, what if an innovation unit's raison d'etre was actually to create relationships, to actually build relational capital, to make links between other parts of the organization, to liberate people to do things themselves. So the idea that we might actually be creating value in relationships rather than in tangible assets is a bit of a kind of a mental leap for many, many people. And I think the UN context works much better than it does in a corporate context. So there you go, some quick thoughts from me. Uh, I mean, there's much more to say, but let me pause there because I think there's lots of room for, for, for discussion. Uh, Tina, back to you. Thank you, Katya, thank you, Julian. Um, 
I think that this kind of was a great staging or setting the context in which we want to discuss. And then uh, I think also a great framing for uh, the inputs from our practitioners. Um, just wanted kind of as a summary, I think it's, it's very important to think about, you know, what are we trying to achieve with those innovation units? When we speak about innovation, what is it really, right? We see product processes and so on. And that ultimately, as Julian also discussed at length, what, what is the ultimate target, right? Do we want to reach uh, beneficiaries? Of course, we, we want that, right? But we also want to transform the organizations. And uh, we also want to create those partnerships that make a lasting impact. So um, that, uh, I think, uh, is an excellent starting point for our practitioners. But I still want to pause for um, a minute or two to take some quick clarification questions or anything that uh, Katya and uh, Julie have said, any comments you have on that, any questions before we delve into the much more concrete cases. Uh, for all of the audience, uh, you can either ask questions in the chat, of course, or uh, I think we're, we're kind of a not too big group, so you can also just uh, speak up and unmute yourself. Well, apparently everything was crystal clear. That's always the best. So uh, then I move right on to uh, Nick, who will uh, start sharing her perspective from UNDP. Great, there we go. And uh, my first slide, thank you, Katja, right on time. So hello, everybody, I'm, I'm Nick. Obviously, I'm working at the United Nations Development Programme. Uh, I'm, I'm from New Zealand originally, if you're wondering where on earth my strange accent comes from, um, but currently I live in Spain. Um, uh, yes, as, as Tina mentioned, I've worked at the World Food Program and their innovation accelerator also, but prior to that I was at PwC, so um, an experience consulting, so really jumping through lots of different organizations and seeing innovation uh, in many different forms and having it work and not work often, so, uh, so really happy to share my thoughts with you today. This slide deck is mainly about UNDP, so no, go for, yeah, next slide is good. So key thing to say, this is straight from our, our digital strategy. We really want to place UNDP as a thought leader in digital development. Now, I don't mean for the coders out there um, developing products as in laying down code. We mean development as in humanitarian development and using digital for that development. Also in integrating digital technologies in all of our advisory capacity optimizing our delivery models and creating new ones. So it's quite a broad, in terms of digital and uh, digital innovation, it's quite a broad mandate there. Next slide should show you why. So here's some of the, the problems that have just only emerged in the last year, year and a half due to, due to the pandemic. First of all there on the left, the severity of the digital divide has been exposed. So 750 million people live in unserviced areas, so there's no, so no internet. And then there are 3.3 billion people who live in areas that are covered by the internet, but do not use it either because of lack of skills or lack of affordability. So, so this is what they're calling the digital divide, huge amounts, huge uh, yeah, portions of the population who, who can't get online. What does that mean? Uh, the next one along there, digital transformation can make inequality worse if not intentionally inclusive. So if people are in rural areas or are, are, can't access the internet, then they're likely often to, if you're transforming, uh, doing digital transformation of government services, say there's a, a new health service that's online, then those people aren't gonna get access to it. So that actually makes inequality worse, not better. Um, digitalization comes with its own risks like misinformation, privacy, uh, violence, all of that um, requires more of our attention. Uh, so the idea that um, in the past people have often thought, oh, digit technology is neutral and, you know, it can, can sort of solve many of the world's problems. But we're, what we're finding is that it's not necessarily neutral. Algorithms aren't necessarily neutral. Um, and, uh, and that they can cause huge division and massive risk to, to societies. So just keeping in mind that uh, technology comes with risks, not just with benefits. And last but not least, governments which already invested previously in digital, um, they responded more effectively when the pandemic hit, as you can well imagine, if they were somewhat set up, then their, their kind of recovery to, to somewhat normal was much quicker than those who 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 hadn't really thought about it or done very little. 
next slide. Um, so just to say that innovation, digital innovation has been in UNDP for a long time. So um, yeah, and but that we had only had our very first digital strategy in 2019. And also interestingly, um, we have the first ever chief digital officer, which is my boss, Robert Opp. Um, he was appointed in 2019. And that's the first time there's ever been a chief digital officer in the UN system. So it's all quite new in a way to the, to the UN. Okay, next slide. Um, uh, yeah, so we have we have lots of different assets, innovation assets. I think that was on, mentioned also on Kutch's slides. So we have accelerator labs, 92 labs across 116 countries, which I'll talk about later. We've got um, a global innovation team, which is different again, which looks more at kind of strategic innovation. We have the Singapore Global Center. We have, I'm in that chief digital office on the side there. We've also got co corporate IT that's working at the kind of more traditional thing you'd think of in terms of digital transformation and a group of advocates. So in the next slide, I will uh, go into that later. Uh, this, is, this is my office, so I'm here in the chief digital office and we work on those four things that you see there. So uh, on the left, innovation, digital innovation and scaling support, which you mentioned, scaling being a challenge. Also new program areas and country support. And then on the right, it's a little more internal facing. So capacity building, building skills and innovation and digital, and usually doing that through networks and also improving our technology and our data advisory. Next slide. Um, so this is where I feel we, uh, the UN's values and mandate come in strongly. So we've developed a very clear vision for what digital development means. It's about, it's about being very strategic. It's about the whole of society. So it's not just citizens, it's also refugees and visitors. It's um, intentionally inclusive. Uh, UNDP's mission is to leave no one behind. And that also means digitally leaving no one behind. Uh, we proactively consider the ethical risks of technology. Whereas I think a, in a lot of the, the kind of corporate sector that uh, profit will often come first over what's really best for the user or the customer necessarily. Um, take, take your our endless scrolling habits, for example, that's not good for our mental health, uh, our relationships or our attention spans. And yet, um, or, yeah, social media, et cetera, we, that tends to still, still uh, use those same habit-forming addictive techniques because they sell really well. So we, on the other hand, the UN, don't have the commercial mandate, so we can really um, work kind of against that and make sure that it's very ethical and good for people. Um, and last but not least, we work at a global scale, but rooted very much in local ecosystems. So the next slide, um, I'm going to race through. I'm just going to... Um, I guess say the challenge and then three of our responses. So firstly, we have to create and innovate and yeah, create change in an organization that is absolutely huge. It's almost 20,000 people. Also our mandate is incredibly broad. So it's gender, poverty, governance, crisis and resilience, energy and the environment, plus more. Um, 170 country offices and we're very decentralized. Also we're incredibly diverse. So all of those are strengths, but also challenges. The three on the next slide, um, we've got the three, three things I'll mention quickly now, the accelerator labs, the digital advocate network and our digital X scale accelerator. So the next slide, a couple of slides are about the um, accelerator labs. So there they all are, 91 of them spread across the globe. Um, next slide. Uh, the mission is to identify, test and pilot innovative grassroots solutions to a portfolio of complex challenges spanning poverty, climate and accountable governance. So um, they really take a kind of a complex systems approach um, and working in agile ways you see on the, on the right there. Next slide. Um, I'm, I'm so impressed by this. So the, if you look at that, 24% of the staff in the accelerator labs across the globe, and there's at least three in every lab, uh, repatriate so often Perhaps it's Colombia. It'll be a Colombian national who's perhaps been away um, and, and learned some corporate innovation skills or complex systems skills, and then come back to Colombia to live in Colombia and solve problems for Colombia with these innovation skills that they've uh, learned elsewhere. There's lots more 
stats there, but you can see 65% bring experience from the private, nonprofit, and academia and government. So very broad, broad, broad skills. Next slide. Uh, the next thing I'll quickly mention is the Digital Advocate Network. Um, so this is different. So the other one was sort of Innovation Accelerator. This one um, is uh, a one person in every single of our country offices who has a, has a full-time role in, in some, you know, something else who's raised their hand and also been kind of elected to, to be the advocate for digital in their country office. Um, so it's very powerful. They support ideas and initiatives aim at improving country, so inter internal and external outcomes. And the key is that it's a network, so they can, we connect them. It's their ideas and their shared experience is very powerful. Next slide. And this is them. We've even got the guy dabbing in the background. Um, it's a super diverse bunch, very happy, very, very engaged, really trying to make a difference. And the power for change, this to drive change really is in the people. So kind of creating a movement and bringing people together, not to be underestimated. Next slide. Um, and last but not least, this is my second to last slide, to we also have a digital X scale accelerator. So this is focused on supporting mature and proven solutions to scale. Um, we've just about finishing, we're graduating our first cohort. We had over 180 applications and only 10 that were selected. And on the next slide, we've got the process that they went through, which involved mentorship and cohort meetups and learning sessions. Um, again, this isn't about taking a brand new idea and seeing if it has legs. It was, it's about taking things that are really working in certain places and then scaling them to others so that we can amplify the, the good stuff. And I think that's my last slide if we skip to the next one. Oh, super quickly, what's next? So we're going to continue to scale the things that are working. We're going to work, continue to work at the intersection of development and emerging and ex exponential tech. We are very much trying to drive a sort of go global cooperation. This is a relationships piece on the use and advancement of digital technology, but specifically in service of people and planet, not just profit. Um, and we're looking to shape UNDP's response to challenges that are uniquely digital by nature. And that's me. Thank you so much, Nick, for this fantastic overview about the, the many great things that UNTP does, which, which I guess the general public is, is not particularly aware of, right? And of course, the organizing challenges that this all has for, you know, how you, you do this on a global scale for a truly global organization. Excellent. So we're going to move to Corinne as our next speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you, Tina. So uh, you have the slides, so I can I can just suggest when time is uh, is uh, when it's time to change them. So hi everybody. I'm I'm here a little bit as a an imposter because I'm no longer in the uh, in the UN system, but very much still linked with the uh, Geneva Innovation Movement. Um, I was, uh, as Tina said before, in the UN office at Geneva. I mean, I was in the UN for over thirty years and many years of these at the end of my career, uh, of my UN career, in the U UN office at Geneva, where uh, among other things, I was director of information and director of conference management. And in that last incarnation, I was heading a, a very, very large uh, division of 600 people. So what we did was nothing at the scale that uh, Nick described for UNDP, of course, but with 600 people, there's still, uh, there is still quite a lot of, uh, of work that can be done. And for, for the UN Secretariat, it's a, it, it was a very large division. I think it may have been the largest in the UN Secretariat. So what, what I found was uh, when I uh, took over that division was a, a number of people very scared by the introduction of uh, digital technologies, seeing technology as, uh, as the enemy because it was threatening their jobs. So I really tried to, um, uh, so the, my, my uh, goal in, in uh, developing an innovation mechanism in the division was as much to reconcile people with digital technologies and, and let them see them as opportunities rather than threats. Uh, it was also to increase uh, in general di digital literacy in the division, and, uh, but also to, uh, to respond to budgetary uh, pressures and to the need for uh, efficiencies and in general, also to get people excited uh, by their job, which sometimes when you are in the language professions in particular, 
it can be, some people are very excited, love, love it, but because it's quite repetitive, it can be difficult to remain fully engaged for you know, 20 years, 30 years. So these were my, my overarching goals. And I set up a, an innovation team. Um, so not an innovation unit, but an innovation team, and for several reasons. So maybe we can go to the first, uh, to the next slide. Yeah. So, um, you know, there was a lot of cynicism, and uh, I just like to show this because it, it, it gives a little bit of the general atmosphere that I, that I found and that exists, you know, in the UN Secretariat, which, which sits at the center of the UN universe, but it's very, very specific. In fact, it's quite different from the from the funds and programs and agencies because of its uh, because it is mostly funded by the regular budget. And that I will come to that. But that that has a lot of implications on innovation. So maybe the next uh, the next uh, slide. Uh, no, I think we missed one. There should be one. No. Oh, oh there's one missing. All right, so can, uh, if you let me, uh, yeah, there's one missing. So if you let me share my screen, maybe I can, uh, I can show you the, uh, the one missing. Okay, so. Um, uh, if I manage, there. Uh, am I sharing my screen now? Not yet. I, bon. Sorry about this. Uh, never mind. You know what? Never mind. It's okay. So if we go back to the, uh, did you allow me to share my screen? Am I? Yes, yes, you did. Okay. So I will try now. Apologies to everyone. This is the, okay. And this is it. This is it. Excellent. All right. All right. Uh, voila. This is it. I think we're there. I don't know why that uh, was missing. Anyway, so there are challenges that are true in the UN Secretariat for Innovation, which are true in general in the public sector. And I think Julian shared some of it. I really want to insist on that first point, which I always make, is that there are very good reasons why the public sector in general and the UN in particular is very cautious because it's not our money. It's not our money. And there is a special uh, accountability which is in play when you're using someone else's money. So when you're in the public sector, it's the, it's the public's money and it's not your money. So you can't do with it what you would do if it was your own money or if you had invested money in a company. So that's, that's the ethical part, which I think is normal and it, it's, it's good, but it does mean that uh, we have special, uh, special reporting mechanisms, very little uh, flexibility which, uh, which can be a problem. So not only is not our money, but there's very little money uh, to start with. As you know, the UN has been under constant, the UN secretary at least has been un under constant budgetary pressures for, for the last uh, 30 years, ever since I started my career actually in the UN. So budgets are set by, uh, budgets are set by a committee, the fifth committee of the General Assembly in the UN. And every single little dollar has to be accounted for. It's extremely rigid, much more so than for funds or agencies that are uh, funded uh, it, at least in part with um, extra budgetary contributions. So there's much, much less leeway. Um, so that means also there was a question in the chat about incentives. We in the UN Secretariat, you cannot provide financial incentives for innovation. So you just have to find other incentives because that doesn't exist. And I don't think that's a problem by itself. And by the way, I do think that budgetary pressures can act actually be a great uh, incentive for innovation just because we have to find efficiencies all the time. So the, the saying is uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And I think that's very true in the UN system. And I think that was true for you know, some of the uh, most innovative uh, parts of the UN system are WFP, UNHCR, which because they always had to, uh, the, the needs they have to address are so much bigger than the resources they have, have become very innovative. Okay, so there's no, there's little money, but there is, there are plenty of organic grams. And I, I think Julian, when uh, already described this, 
our structures are really extremely hierarchical. So the fact that, you know, you have to get five signatures for everything that you, are, that you undertake is of course very well understood a, a, a problem for innovation. And it's not even always the hierarchies, but it, it's even, it's, it really is very much the rules. The rules are regulation and regulations are very detailed. So I'll, I'll give you an example. For instance, there are very, very um, uh, strict rules for procurement processes in the UN and for very good reasons to combat corruption and so on. But these rules can really be a problem when you're trying to experiment, for instance, with different tools, because uh, you can't just purchase a software, you know, you have to go through a whole process. So that in itself renders the innovation process much more uh, cumbersome and difficult. We were trying to set up, for instance, a big exhibition of, of um, uh, material for conferencing uh, with, uh, with companies. And we did manage to uh, reach an agreement with our procurement co uh, colleagues, but it was so difficult. It took so long that we nearly gave up. So just to say that those are really impediments to in innovation. And the culture, I think we've discussed, it's, <clears throat> You know, it's it's very difficult, even though that has changed, I find really in the last 10 years. But in in general, it's because of you know, because of everything I've said above, the 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 culture is very risk avert. There is very little tolerance for, for failure. And when there are many failures, because the UN is not better or worse than any other organization, failures occur, but they're never discussed openly, ever. They, the, the failures are always hidden, which means that they are presented as semi-successes. So it's, this is really, for me, one of the main uh, problems. So the specific, uh, all these, I think, apply to the public sector in general, but the, in, in the UN, what is also very, very difficult is being mentioned, I think, by Tina at the very, at the very start, 193 bosses and um, because a lot of the decisions are taken by consensus by by the member states that uh, favors the status quo because you know when when decisions have been reached after very 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 long and complex negotiation you don't want to reopen anything anytime soon so that really also is uh, is an impediment to innovation so the the second, the second problem is I thought it wasn't so much of a problem actually. When I started with my division, uh, I had assumed that the levels of digital literacy were quite low. But in fact, what I discovered is that there were incredible hidden talents at all levels. People who had uh, assistance jobs, um, who in fact had incredible IT skills that they were not using in their jobs. But uh, the, the very specific thing about the UN is that uh, because the organization um, can give uh, visas for people to stay in a specific place, like for instance, here in Geneva, many people join the UN not because of the job they're going to do, but because of the, of the uh, ability that the organization has to keep them in one, in the place where they want to be. So what, what it means is that there's a lot of overqualified people, some of whom have very high digital skills, but that we're not making use of. And on the other hand, we have a lot of people in managerial positions in particular, whose, di whose digital literacy is very low. So this is it. So it's not that the overall di digital literacy was quite low, but it was these uneven uh, and uh, ill distributed uh, skills that were more of the problem. There was also the problem that we have, uh, we have few data in, in the organization for a number of processes. So now this is also of course changing. And I'm talking about six years ago when I started all this process. But for instance, we were trying to look at a queue management system. Anyone who has tried to enter the Palais des Nations before COVID knows that it could take, you know, going through security took a very long time. So when we look at this, we, we, we realized that there were very few data about how long the queue was, at what part of the day, who it was that was in line and so on. So the, the fact that uh, there aren't that, that many data available makes it difficult to apply some of the uh, digital solutions. On the other hand, 
the UN has a secret weapon for innovation, which I will discuss at the end of this presentation. And I'm going to rush because I know I'm already being too long. So I set up this, uh, this uh, innovation team and I, I set up a team rather than a unit because I was not allowed within our rules to set up a unit. So what I did, and there was, I wasn't allowed really either to divert resources from the regular budget. In fact, once, once or twice, I was actually threatened with losing my job uh, because I was seen as diverting resources for, uh, for uh, innovation and, uh, and other things. So the, it, you have to, to tread a very careful path there. Huh? So um, I managed to allocate resources without uh, seeming to allocate resources. So it was all by stealth. What I did is I took this team and each of the uh, uh, staff on the team of, uh, it was a team of uh, eight uh, people uh, were uh, just devoting 20% of their time to uh, innovation. So one day a week. So that had a uh, downside, of course, because they were doing a lot of other things and they didn't have much time. But the, the, the great advantage of this is that they continued being embedded in their business units. And this is something that uh, Julian had uh, alluded to at the, uh, at the start of this event, is that if you have a unit that's completely separate from the business units, the communication becomes difficult, they're seen as an innovation ghetto, and that doesn't necessarily work. But the people in, in the team, not only were they rotating on a regular basis, but they were working four days a week with the others. So there was constant back and forth and good communication with the business units, okay? So I allocated a room, I allocated 20% uh, uh, of the time of these people, and I allocated uh, their time also, a, a few resources in terms of paying for training here and there, allowing them to travel to some events and so on. But, you know, modestly, but in any case, we saw from the poll at the start that the resources are not normally the real problem. So we focused very much on the users. So we started with the human-centered uh, design thinking approach. So we really canvassed all the, the delegates that go to conferences to understand their needs. We did on-the-spot interviews, in-depth interviews. Um, we did all kinds of... Uh, of uh, workshops, uh, design thinking workshop uh, with uh, you know creating this persona. So we with with the uh, with the uh, design thinking experts. So that was very very useful. And I think the strength of this process was the fo focus on the end users. We uh, we really uh, tried to work um, as openly as possible. You you are all from the uh, or nearly all from the UN world. You know that it's 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 a world of silos. So we really tried to to open the doors. I made sure that the people went regularly to events organized by others. The first thing we went in fact was to knock on the door of the innovation teams that already existed in UNHCR in particular uh, and talk to everyone in the, in the UN system what, about what they were doing. And uh, we also organized a big uh, uh, event which we called InnoVent which was about innovation in conferencing and we invited people from the European institutions and so on. So really we talked to the private sector. So really we tried to open the doors and break the silos. We tried to make it fun because, you know, as I said, the people's jobs can be quite dry. Not everybody has a fun day job, frankly. So we, we for instance, we did something which was, was very successful. We call it the Dragon Den. We organized a, a sort of innovation challenge and and we used the the format of the tv show the dragon den and that was very successful just because it was fun so that's that's uh, something that we mustn't forget um so we tried to communicate a lot through the dragon den and other things to to the people in the division and 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 in general in the un office at geneva very very widely at the same time because because of all the aversion to risk, because of all the, the rigidity in the budget, I, I had to be careful all the time about not being too visible, not, you know, and not upsetting uh, management, basically. You know? And this last point on my slide, which is about managing upwards, I think is a really key thing to think of uh, for innovation units. You always have, to get in the buy-in from, from the leaders of the organization, you have to make sure that no one feels threatened up, up, up there because otherwise you could get in, the, in a lot of troubles. 
you have we one thing which I was able to do is I did the only real resource that I allocated was a coordinator for the innovation team. So everyone did that in addition to their day job. But there was one person who was working half time for uh, to drive the innovation, coordinating the work of the team. And this is a person that came from management consultant uh, consultancy, and she brought a lot of structure to the chaos of innovation. And that was really, really key, I think. Um, and the innovation team was totally uh, not hierarchical. People of all levels were mixing in there and that really worked a lot, uh, very well as well. So uh, I have uh, so much more that I could say, but I do just want to say that I've, I've um, despite all the challenges I uh, outlined at the start, one thing which is key in the UN and which I think a lot of the uh, private sector is reflecting on at this at this moment is uh, that innovation and diversity are two coins uh, are two sides of the same coin because you can't have innovation with teams that are completely homogeneous it's just not going to happen because of course there's there's group thing by by nature um, so the UN has inbuilt diversity by its charter by the fact I mean the UN Secretariat has very strict quotas about how many people it can recruit it has also strict guidelines about how many you know about uh, gender diversity and so on and this is an incredible asset in fact because the diversity is inbuilt you don't have to pay expensive consultants to come and, and bring diversity to the organization It's there from the start so what what I found was the the team that the innovation team that was set up in my division was very diverse, except in, and that was a huge, uh, huge asset because people brought completely different perspective to things. It was very diverse, except for one in one point. When I called for volunteers to uh, join the team uh, of eight people, uh, I had uh, about 20, the first time I had about 20, applicants and uh, of them two were men. So I just leave you with that thought about what that may mean, but uh, remember that uh, diversity is key to innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Corinne, for sharing your insights and, and thoughts on that. So I hand it over to, to Marcus. Uh, Marcus, do you wanna share your slides yourself or? Perfect. Then, uh... Last but not least, uh, from a slightly different organization, not the UN, but I think an organization that UN can certainly learn from as well. So uh, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Tina, and good afternoon to all of you. And thank you for inviting me to this interesting discussion. Yes, indeed, we are not so far away from our friends uh, in downtown Geneva and UN. Uh, but yes, we do very different things. So I will share the screen. And I hope that uh, we get this through okay. So here are my slides. I uh, hope you can see them. Maybe somebody nods. Okay, fine. So um, this perspective about innovation uh, at CERN. So let me just very quickly remind everybody what CERN is, if, if you are not familiar. Um, CERN is a basic research organization and we basically probe the ultimate structure of the universe. We do this by accelerating. This is a, actually a, an accelerator lab. I'm not sure whether we make it on Nick's uh, slides, but uh, we, are, we are actually an accelerator lab, but accelerator of particles. Um, although we do say accelerating science and innovation, and I will be focusing obviously on that latter part in a moment. So here you see a nice picture. You can see the Large Hadron Collider, a round circular, and then you can see these acronym CMS, Atlas, and so on and so forth. These are detectors and the particles collide in the center of them. And we generate digital images, high resolution, big data stuff uh, to analyze uh, the fundamental forces just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. So in a nutshell, the, the connection between science and, and innovation uh, is this. We generate new knowledge. Uh, we push the limits of knowledge in terms of both physics and technology. And for the purposes of our basic fundamental research mission, we need to develop new, de new technologies. This is in both in the accelerators, physical particle accelerators, and detection and imaging related technologies. And, and uh, this uh, has implications in medical imaging, the web was invented here, touchscreen displays, and things like that. 
The third key pillar is training of next generation of scientists and innovators. And I will get back to this in a moment. And of course, the collaborative approach that we have, our collaborations are really big. Uh, the two big ones in LHC, they contain together more than 6,000 researchers, uh, engineers, uh, computer scientists, and students. So these are big undertakings. When we talk about these projects, they are really big. Now, for the purposes of uh, this discussion today, since the keyword is unit, I had some ping pong emails with Tina trying to kind of make the discussion enough focused for any meaningful discussion from our side. So we decided that we will focus on Idea Square. Idea Square is the building in which I am. You can see the background here. It's a technical building. It's an innovation space. And what we do here is that we connect our science with society. We do that by connecting both the way we do science, the technology that we may have here available, and linking it to sustainable development goals related challenges. So that is the connection that we try to do here in new ways. So the classical technology transfer that you are very familiar with where something is being developed and then hopefully deployed for society. Uh, yes, we do that at CERN, but here we are not particularly focused on that. We are rather interested in making a connection between our science, science and, and societal impact. Now I know that this word impact triggers immediately the question, well, how do you guys measure impact? Uh, there are many ways. We don't have one specific way of doing it, but based on the previous slide, you can easily guess. Uh, we talk about number of publications, number of, mm -hmm. of degrees, PhDs, master level degrees, uh, the visibility in media, uh, the industrial return, how companies work with us and benefit from us, and the number of quality, of course, of the research and development and innovation projects, number of students, uh, number of student projects. In fact, here in Idea Square, we have many more. We, for instance, ask the question, how many new people do visitors who come here meet uh, per day? The number is about five. Uh, we also measure the number of uh, coffee cups. Uh, we m measure the number of, of uh, milkshakes and, and, uh, and um, milk being used, which is a big mystery. There's more milk being used than uh, all cows calculated in Switzerland can produce, so it's a mystery. I still haven't figured that out, but it's telling us about something. Whether it's relevant or not is another story. So what we do then is that we bring students that interact with our personnel here at CERN, not only CERN folks, but people from other organizations, and uh, we make them interact. And the sort of the, the secret joke inside CERN is that we put them all in these containers that you can see behind us, and, and then we wait for a miracle. That's a scientific uh, explanation of the process of innovation that we don't quite understand how it happens. We know it happens. We know it reflects very closely the process, how we develop our own scientific equipment. Uh, but what, what the process exactly is, is a bit of a mystery. And we have been trying to decipher this together with our friends uh, from outside uh, uh, CERN. Uh, you can see a little link here. If you, Tina, if you are interested, she can share uh, with pleasure these slides and these links here take you to documentation. It's not that it's a key word. It's more than linking it to, uh, to documentation. So we do, our inspiration is that we try to inspire students by giving them the license to dream. Uh, by that, we mean that uh, uh, we spend maybe a few percent of our time in thinking of the impossible. And uh, then we don't take that as a no, but we really go for it. And therefore, the processes that we do here, we would like to at least believe ourselves that we are talking about breakthrough innovation. Now, innovation, of course, is a broad term and it can be understood in many ways. Uh, what we mean by innovation is that we are developing technologies mainly for our own use, primarily for our own use, that is pushing our science through technology. It's a, it's a circle. I mean, they feed each other. And in that process, we hope that something useful comes out also for society. But that is not our main objective. It's a kind of a secondary fallout. So using the typology that uh, Julian introduced a bit earlier, if you kind of want to use that to picture us, I'd say that we are doing exploration and internal sizing in internal opportunities. That's roughly where we are. But there is, as I said, a link also to the external opportunities. So that's roughly on Julian's map where we are. I would also like to remind that we're talking about long time frames. When we start to design and construct an accelerator or detect the system, the time span just to get the first physics is way over 20 years, and then it will run another 20 years. So a project life cycle from 
from the dreaming to, to, to switching the device off when it's not producing any more uh, interesting new physics is, it could be up to 40 years, four or years. It's a long, long time timeline. So one example of, of how we then do this connection between science and society is the student programs I just mentioned in the previous slide. So what we have a program is called Challenge-Based Innovation. And uh, it's a five to six month master level student program where we invite students from different fields, fields outside the usual suspects that we have. Uh, by that, I mean product design, business management, and engineering. These are the three areas. And then we give them SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, related assignments. And the key point here is that we are focusing here at IDSWay on the process. So we are using design thinking. Uh, we are not obsessed by it, but we find it very useful. And uh, we've been hearing about design thinking already earlier. It's super good for um, emphasizing the role of the end customer. So typically, what we do is that we develop our own technologies and then we kind of worry about whether it could be useful or not. Here at IDS where we do the reverse. We start from the societal needs, driven by SDGs in this case, and then we try to see whether there are technologies here at CERN or elsewhere where we could make a match so that uh, we could make a link uh, between what we do and what could be useful for society. So the kind of joke that we are playing um, is uh, we say, we are, well, we're trying to systematize serendipity, which obviously is an oxymoron. But um, in the lack of a better word or definition, this is the kind of joke that uh, we kind of like to um, uh, kind of foster. So just to kind of summarize this all, uh, this is a very elementary, um, and I apologize for my PowerPoint uh, drawing skills, but I hope you kind of capture the point. So you could describe the innovation process uh, in a kind of a two by two matrix and outside high energy physics, we just love them uh, by technology and focus. And typically, as I mentioned earlier, the process that we do generally speaking here CERN, is through the R and D for our own needs. That means to say accelerators and detectors here, I've just mentioned detectors, but it's equivalent for the accelerators in the upper, upper left corner. And then on the lower down right corner, you can see the, the student program, the CBI Challenge Based Innovation Program I just mentioned, where we engage students. And the, the challenge really, uh, Tina asked me to say, well, what's the biggest challenge? Well, it's very nicely drawn here, but I can tell you that it's much easier to draw things than to actually make it happen. So the biggest challenge we have is actually make this meaningful connection between our basic driven mission, which is understanding the, the birth of the universe and having an impact in terms of sustainable development goals. So it's kind of obvious statement. And it, uh, but that's what we really, really, we find very, we kind of, I wouldn't say struggle, but this is a huge challenge. So we have had over 1,200 students since the past six years here. And if you would ask me, well, how many webs uh, have we developed here or how many other things that have had a real impact in society, I would have to, say that, well, nothing of that caliber, but we do see uh, a big impact in terms of the, of the, if you like, the mindset of the students that we have here. Now that again might sound a bit cheap, but what we mean by this is that uh, we try to push our students to get out of the so-called incremental um, innovation mode and that they really look at societal challenges uh, on the systemic level. And I think that the two previous speakers mentioned that, and I'd like to build in particular on what Nick was saying earlier about risk, because risk is here key. Uh, our feeling is that today's uh, economically driven society, and there are good reasons for it, is, is, is really very scared of risk. Uh, so everything that we tend to teach everybody and do ourselves in terms of innovation should be as low risk because it's government controlled or, or it's uh, just not nice for investors if there's a risk that they lose money, all sorts of reasons. And uh, the way we see this is that, that the best um, area where organizations like CERN and universities in more general, where they can operate in this innovation space is in the early, early stage, the fuzzy front end of the innovation where the technology readiness level is very low. I mean, you know, one or two or three or something like that. So what we do is that we're quite good, we think, in risk absorption which is another way of saying, well, value creation, but we are not so good in the value capturing. And this is usually where this innovation discussion takes place. What's the value of what you do? You know, how does grandma benefit from this? And so on and so forth. 
which is more on the what we would call risk deduction. And this is not semantics. Risk absorption versus risk reductions are two different phases. And the first one is to come with the clever ideas in terms of, let's say, options theory. We are very good in generating options. But then the question comes, can these option, options be called either by us or by society? So the way to look at these graphs and, and, and to ask if you want to ask, well, what's, what's then the impact and how do you measure it? What's the, are we doing the right thing? I, I think uh, Julian will be asking that same question in a moment. So that, that, is a, that is the key. And of course, depending how you want to define impact, there are many ways. Maybe education itself, uh, in itself is enough in our case, maybe not. But what I think is very interesting, and what uh, Julian brought out and Tina are working on this, uh, Cathy and others, is this aspect of value in relationships. Because in this graph, what you can see is that there's hardcore technology in the upper left corner. And then you're on the right, that right downside, you can see it's a bunch of people doing something. And then you can kind of ask yourself, well, indeed, what's the connection? And is, what, where is the value? And uh, I think that uh, this idea to assess that in terms of the, of the value of the relationships, in terms of how it connects with society, in terms of links with different organizations and individuals, I think is an extremely interesting one. And we will be here at Idea Square looking more closely into that. And we very much look forward to hearing from all of you, hearing your views on this, and hopefully collaborating on this topic together. So thank you, Tina, and back to you. Thank you so much, Marcus. Uh, lots of super interesting ideas and I think an excellent springboard for our discussion now. Um, many thoughts in my head, but I'll leave it to Julian to, to summarize and uh, direct his thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I'll, I'll keep it super short because we've only got 15 minutes, I think, before we're finished. But, but um, listening to the three speakers, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. And, and of course, I think what's going through many people's minds is, you know, it, what is unusual or distinctive or even unique about this context? Um, and I mean, there's not much that's absolutely unique, right? It's in, I mean, particularly listening to Corinne talking about all the, all the challenges are things that I think people working in large corporates would recognize. But, but we can absolutely, I think, acknowledge that success, if you like, in the, in the world of a, of a UN agency um, is, is a more multifaceted an indeterminate thing than it is in a corporate setting. I mean, corporates are talking about, you know, purpose, but it's still very easy to, to identify a bottom line that, that everybody can kind of orient themselves, themselves around. And so that, for me, that, that is the, the crux of it, because when you talk about building relationships, connections, building capabilities, educating people, in a corporate setting, these are nothing more than means to an end. Whereas in a UN setting, it may be that these are ends in themselves. It may actually be that simply building greater education competencies among thousands of people is actually one of the things that you're trying to achieve. Um, and it may well be that making links and actually helping people to understand each other better is also an end in itself. So that's, that's all good. And that's why I think we can take a much more kind of Catholic view as to what these innovation units do. It doesn't completely get away from the problem. I think Karin already touched on this, perhaps Marcus and Nick as well, which is the innovation unit activity is still going to justify its existence. And, and that's therefore you know, in, in, incumbent on all of us to figure out better ways of showing that the things that we've achieved are actually valuable. We've got to create metrics. They don't have to be financial metrics, but we do have to create metrics that you can then turn around and show to your stakeholders to say, you know, we, we've done what we wanted to. Um, and that for me is the, the kind of the, the ultimate sort of challenge that we're trying to grapple with. here. Thank you, Julian. Um, if I just may, may kind of add my thoughts to this, because I think this this ultimate challenge where also Marcus ended up, you all touched on is, you know, what is the ultimate impact, right? And uh, in uh, in all of these organizations, including our own and universities, right? I mean, the impact is not an immediate one, right? It's always an intermediate one, right? First, you, you discover something, you publish a paper, you you and, and so it goes, right? But I think it's the same in all the UN organizations. And what, what adds to this is not only the, you know, the, the bureaucratic organizations, but it's also the nature of the problems, right? Because because the problems we're trying to tackle, they're all kind of globally intertwined. 
issues, right? So issues you can only address on a global scale, but yet you can't find any solution that is not locally embedded, right? Because you have so many different uh, institutional environments, different cultures, different uh, governments, regulations, rules, whatever. So kind of finding this balance of addressing something at, at the global yet the local scale, um, I think is an additional layer of complexity that uh, at least one that we haven't, haven't discussed so far. So um, maybe we can have um, one round of kind of closing remarks um, before we do a big word cloud, hopefully with all the participants on what you kind of see as the innovation priorities in the UN. But first I'd like our panelists to give their kind of final remarks on uh, how you think uh, we can actually work to uh, become more innovative in the end. What is, what is kind of the one thing if uh, we can write a, a list to Santa Claus that you'd have next solved? Is it the metrics challenge? Is it uh, kind of how to uh, reach scale? Is it, uh, you know, changing the internal processes? Well, what is it really where you think this would actually be a real stepping stone to making innovation a reality in the types of organizations here? Whoever wants to go first goes first. And of course, uh, Katya, Julian, um, you're also most welcome to chip in. <laughs> I think I, I'm going to hold off. I want to hear from, from Nick and Corinne and Marcus, if that's okay. It, so maybe, you know, I think we, we come back to the, to the issue of uh, impact. I've put a couple of things in the chat about this and, the, and Julian also, also has, has uh, commented. There are, in fact, I mean, part of the UN is actually always driven by very tangible results and that's counterintuitive because we think it's a big talk shop and da, 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 and it's about making relationship. A lot of the agencies, but a lot of also people who are more in the support services inside the UN, which was my case for in my last uh, uh, incarnation, this was about delivering very tangible services to people. So you can measure that and you can measure the inputs and the outputs and it was all I mean, we were measuring all day long, frankly. So <laughs> it was it it can be it, it and in fact th there was too much focus on this on on this measurement which 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 took a lot of our energies and which in a in a way also was so was not very helpful for uh, for uh, for innovation so but i do think that as julian has has said something very important we we while we can measure how many people WFP feeds and, and how many refugees UNHCR host, we cannot, uh, um, we cannot measure the, uh, the impact of our innovation teams, our innov innovation units on, on digital literacy, on, uh, on motivation. So developing uh, uh, sophisticated me uh, metrics that will allow us to develop, to measure also that side of the impact of innovation work would be a huge boost. And if, if the Geneva Innovation Movement was going to do something in that, in that field, that would be actually, I think, incredibly helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne. Um, who wants to, Nick? Yeah, I've got um, just a couple of points. So this is, first of all, I'd love to see innovation. I think real success is when uh, innovation is happening uh, an innovation mindset is happening with everybody in the organization, not just the unit. And, and I think the key shift there, rather than being like, I'm an innovator, is to go, is to shift from, so to take whoever you're trying to serve, whether it be you're in a university and that's students, whether you're in a commercial business and that's customers, or whether you're in the UN and that's the, the beneficiaries or the populations or the countries you're serving, whoever it is you're serving, because inevitably it's somebody, to shift from doing two to do, and then there's a shift to doing four. And really, I think the move now is doing with. So this collaborative working together to find the best solutions, that's where the real magic happens. So for me, the shift for innovation just needs to stop being like, I'm gonna do at and do two and deliver and that, that to how do we collaborate with the people that, that are living with the experiences of the problems we're trying to solve. And the other thing I would say is that I think we need bigger vision. I mean, humans, we are, we seem to, our brains tend to focus on the people immediately around us and in the things that are around us. But I really think we need to try 
very hard to think globally and over the period of the next 10, 20 years, so much bigger, more of a future thinking, and to do some collective, again, collective kind of sense making, because we're in a time of great disruption with technology specifically. And if we don't think this through, it, it could go very dark places. So let's not go there, would be my call to action. Thank you very much. I think a very important point about the direction and the, the vision. Marcus. So I basically will be building on what uh, Nick and, and Corinne were saying. So in, in the con I understood that the, this is in the context of the UN organization. So, so like, like us, I think the UN organizations are addressing very complex uh, problems, challenging problems, uh, which require to find a solution scaling up. And I fully agree that that this in, will and needs to include things like vision. Uh, what it leads to, at least if we now reflect back to my organization, is a systems level approach, meaning that you have to understand the consequences and also the unintended consequences of poking one area and what impact it may have in some other. And that, that requires a sort of a, a really wide picture. And our experience is the only way to do it is to really do it in a collaborative manner. We all talk about collaborations, but doing it is not very easy. And we have to accept that it can be painful. Uh, the joke here at CERN is that the definition of a successful collaboration is just one mile or one, one meter from collapsing, you know, uh, because it's when it's very creative, it's, it's almost impossible to manage. But somehow people pull through because there's that vision that Nick was talking about. So in the end, at least the experience we have seen here at CERN, and I have seen it many times here uh, uh, in Idea Square when we involve these cross-disciplinary students, the challenge is to, is, to, is to understand each other because our language is different, not only because of our cultural background, but also the discipline in which we are. And that requires developing a new language, a common language. And that may take a long time, in our case, it definitely takes years. I don't know how my colleagues in UN see that, but it, that's really the key. And once there is a common understood language and definitions away, then the miracles that Nick was referring to start to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, Katya. Thanks, Tina. Um, I think just to summarize kind of what all three of the practitioners said, I think um, building on what Corrine said as well in terms of the long-term, short-term goals, I think the next priority should be for the UN to always think big, but to take those small steps. And I think sometimes many people working for the UN don't take those little small steps because they feel uh, that the bigger picture is just unattainable. And I so um, this next priority should just be to take that next step, each as an individual, as a team, and then eventually as an organization to, to, to move to that closer to that big, uh, big picture. Thank you for that. Um, I hand back the word back to Julian and maybe Katya, you can already start the word cloud in the beginning. So this is like a um, participation exercise where we ask you all to, uh, to uh, click on the link on the Mentimeter and uh, add your own thoughts about what you think are the innovation priorities for the UN in the future. So um, this is a bit of crowdsourcing on our part that uh, we can also benefit from your insights and ideas. Um, Julian, over to you. Well, I'm not gonna say much more because it feels like we are quite easily converging on the, on the biggest challenges um, uh, around how do you, you know, uh, dimensionalize and impact and how do you educate, if you like, Others that that these that these types of goals that we're we're talking about are actually things that count and and for the academics in the audience this this shift from a, a view that resources you know sit in 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 entities and can be measured to resources reside in relationships is one that I think has been kicked around for years and is we're starting to understand it I mean a lot of the dot com a lot of the you know very sexy kind of virtual companies out there uh, are, are essentially just building relationships. I and mean, what is an ecosystem orchestrator other than simply an entity that creates value by linking others up? I'm thinking of Alibaba and I'm thinking of, of Amazon and so forth. Hugely valuable organizations who create value by building linkages. And, and we've got to kind of get the entire world to, to recognize that, that the old idea that you have to control assets for them to be valuable is one that that is a little bit past its sell-by date. So, 
So I'll, I'll stop there, Tina. I mean, you, you haven't given yourself much time, so I don't know if you want to add a few comments before we finish. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it was, uh, I think, very diverse, but also very converging views from from very different organizations even if we say the un right we also have to acknowledge that UNTP and the un secretariat and unhcr are very very different organizations right so they work very differently um different people and so on so um but i think we'll kind of hit the base on the common ground that we, we need this kind of collaboration across we need the relationships right but i think as marcus said i also feel this as an academic working with the un um that crossing the language boundary right i think is the hardest thing and same is true when we speak about all these collaborations ships that collaboration sorry and relationships one word that we want to have in the future even more intense between private and public sector um they sound fantastic right but how do we actually you know scheme them how do we build that common ground in order to have the conversation right to align our priorities to actually make sure we agree on which risks we take we agree on you know what is the what is the outcomes we agree on uh, common kpis and that's uh, not always easy to do or very difficult to do so kind of beyond the rhetoric to the kind of real doing i think this is something that uh for me, I think I would put on this list of the Mentimeter now, right? Because I think we have an enormous push in the UN to um, pursue innovation, to pursue more innovation. You can see this in all documents. There's a lot of strategies written about this. There's a big push from the current Secretary General. And I think there's also an enormous, from what I'm seeing from my perspective, a bottom-up push of lots of very you know, skilled, very capable, uh, very, very enthusiastic people to drive that change. But often these developments get stuck in the middle, right? because we have layered organizations, because somebody has to take the risk, because somebody has to sign responsible also for the many failures that we have, right? And very interestingly, I think this is where we have the highest overlap between uh, what the UN is struggling with and the, the challenges we see in uh, the big for-profit organizations, right? Where we always see the squeeze on middle management, where we always ask ourselves, how can we better structure different units to make them you know, creative and independent yet accountable? And how can we incentivize, and this was one of the first discussions in the chat, how can we incentivize entrepreneurs who actually go the extra mile, who take the risk? And uh, I concur with Corinne that it does not always have to be financial incentives, right? But we have to create uh, a safe space for uh, people to innovate and to do this. Uh, at all levels, not only from the bottom up, but also from middle management and certainly from the top as well. Um, so this is my perspective on the topic. Um, the word cloud is shaping up, but we see a lot of uh, culture change, transformation, mindset, common language, decentralization, inspiration, linking, uh, horizontal hierarchy. So a, a lot of kind of an, an inspiring, very interesting uh, thoughts here. Thank you all for participating. Uh, thank you for being part of the webinar. Uh, I think this is all uh, available for you to, to watch and recap uh, later on. Uh, I'd like to thank my panelists here. I'd like to thank the uh, Organizing for Good uh, hosts here. Uh, thank you all and uh, have a lovely rest of the day wherever you are. <laughs>